My name is Leonard Kleinrock. I'm chairman of the Computer Science Department at UCLA. We have here a really exciting and dynamic environment. And one of the activities that contributes to that environment and that excitement is the constant flow of visitors who come and spend time with us and interact with our faculty and student body. Each year, we select a few from among the very best researchers in the field and ask them to participate in our distinguished lecture series. The high point of their visit is the presentation of a lecture to our faculty and student body. And at that lecture, they present the state of the art in their field of specialty. They describe the research results, the open problems, and the directions in which the field is likely to go. And as you might expect, these lectures always generate a great deal of enthusiasm and interaction. I'm really pleased you've chosen to join us today. Let's go inside. The lecture's about to begin. Welcome to our fourth distinguished lecture of the academic year. Today we have Larry Roberts with us. Larry Roberts is very special to me. We've been friends for more than a third of a century, longer than most of you, you have been around. Um, let me, in my usual way, describe some of the interesting facts about Larry and how he got to where he is, what motivated him, and some of the important things he did along the way. Larry comes from a family of scientists. His mother and father were both PhDs in chemistry. And of course, therefore, they, around the house, they had some interesting chemicals like fuming sulfuric acid and such like, with a precocious little boy running around. So they hid these chemicals in the rafters. At the age of six, he found them, proceeded to synthesize nitroglycerin. And fortunately, the temperature was too high, it got too hot, and it didn't explode. His father found out about that when Larry was age 30. His sister has a PhD in biology. His other sister also has some graduate degrees. So you can see the environment in which Larry grew up. He was in Connecticut in a not urban community as we know it today. And so our paths are not parallel, but we had some of the same kinds of uh, happenings occur to us. Um, when Larry was just a youth, he built a TV set from a kit in the days long before TVs were popular or had hardly penetrated the uh, consumer marketplace. He built other electronic systems. For example, he built ham radio equipment and uh, transmitted illegally. He uh, built a Tesla coil and an induction coil. I built Tesla coil, but I lived in a growing metropolis called New York City. When I turned it on, all the neighbors knew about it. Every time I turned it on, their TV stopped. When Larry turned it on, fortunately, he just radiated out to Mars. He played the trombone in high school, high school orchestra, as well as in the, um, the town symphony. He could have been our president when you think about it. <laughs> he ranked second in the state in sharpshooting, but his drive was science. And electronics was this specific field he was interested in. And so he went to MIT, where all scientists begin their careers. He got all A's the first year, was moved into their prestigious course 6A, 6 for electrical engineering, a means, or oh, 6B, I'm sorry. 6A was the work study, 6B. All A's and got to be. 6B allows you to go right through to the masters and you sort of pick up the batches along the way. But the trick there is you get the best of MIT's faculty as your instructors. And so he was uh, subject to really probably the best education you could get at that level. On the way, he entertained himself. For example, he made master keys of every building in MIT and most of the other universities and other unstated office buildings and edifices in the greater metropolitan Boston area. As a prank to deflate the ego of an overzealous security officer at MIT, he picked the lock of the security officer's office when he wasn't there, managed to disconnect the man's prized five button telephone those days, five button telephones were prized. Replace it with an Alexander Graham Bell vintage old phone that, you know, you pick the handle off and you're talking <laughs> the box. Got that one to work. Took the good phone down to MIT's main corridor underneath the Great Dome in what was then set up for a display of other things. Put the phone, had to pick the lock, get into the display, put the phone in there, put a label on it saying to whom it belonged, 
locked and went away. It took two days for the security guard, security officer, to find the phone, another day to find a key to get in and retrieve it. In his dormitory, he tapped into the entire campus phone system, and Larry sold intercom, into office, and external phone service through his own phone. He was the first valuated reseller in the telephone business, when you think about it. He published a way to get free access to New York telephone calls, and the students went into orbit. He published in the paper. He sent hi-fi music through, the, uh, through his installed phone system. He once wired, as a, as a much younger man, his girlfriend's telephone, so every time she picked it up, she'd hear a recording of Larry's voice. And this is before there were such things as voice recorders and VCRs, etc. While at MIT, he logged more time onto the, what was the first transistorized computer, the TX0, than anyone else, 700 hours in one year. And the first program he wrote for the IBM 704 was in binary. Remember, binary, not assembler, not high level, not application developer, binary. On a TX0, he was using a flexo writer, and all he had was a manual which described a very high level way to use it, and he had no idea what was going on underneath. And there was no instruction manual. This was a kind of um, homebred machine out of Lincoln Laboratory. So we got the circuit diagrams and interpreted what the instructions were doing, and in fact, proceeded from there to unroll and unravel the entire architecture. He worked on adaptive character recognition using what later became known as neural networks, and in fact pointed out to the leading researchers in the field why their approaches wouldn't work, and in fact he showed them what was needed to make them um, converge. His MS was on dither for picture processing, which he patented. It was used for moon and Mars photographs and transmission of pictures. 20 years later, 20 years is important because 17 years is the life of a patent, he went to Japan and found that all their fax machines were using his same technology at no cost. He went to work at Lincoln Laboratory while a graduate student. Lincoln Laboratory has a prestigious program called the Staff Associate Program, whereby they send you to MIT for graduate school, and they pay you all kinds of money, give you all kinds of resources. Um, that's why I met Larry. I was in the same program. Um, he began to work on the next of the transistors machines at, MI, at Lincoln Laboratory, the TX2. And I was amazed when this young man shared my office, sat down at a desk, and began to look at the manuals describing that machine. And he was trying to figure out and interpreting what every bit was set at when every instruction was, was executed under all the default conditions and all the weird things that you know, a simple-minded person like me couldn't care about. I wanted a program. This guy worried about every default condition. In the process, wrote the operating system and a macro compiler for that machine, which we all use, including myself, for many years. Um, we were all classmates, along with Ivan Sutherland, and both Larry, all, Ivan, Larry, and myself took our PhD defense at Lincoln Laboratory. We had to do a demonstration on TX2. And we, ha we had overlapping committee members, uh, Claude Shannon, Marvin Minsky, and a few other unknown people. And uh, we had to give demonstrations. And I remember in Ivan's case, Ivan had a thing called Sketchpad which would do all kinds of um, constraint satisfaction of structures as well as replication of figures for circuit construction. And Marvin Minsky meandered over to the machine, and while Ivan and Larry and I were talking to this faculty, Minsky created a, uh, a structure which had inconsistent constraints and said, satisfy constraints. And on this large display, you could see the machine iterating, trying to satisfy these constraints, and the object got larger and larger and larger. It was something like the... Uh, the brooms and the source of his apprentice. It just took over the entire machine while we're casually watching there. One night while I was working on the midnight to 7 a.m. shift on the TX2, uh, you know, I have to understand this was a, an experimental machine with pieces missing all the time. And so there were registers missing and spaces in the console. Um, and late at night, when you're all alone for hours at a time, you know what all the sounds are. You know, it's late and you're tired and become tuned, you're sort of part of this machine. I began to hear a sound that wasn't consistent, a kind of and you began to panic because you figure something's about to crash. So I looked around, I was scanning, and in one of those places where the register was missing, a gap in the console, I saw two eyes looking at me, and it was him. <laughs> I went into orbit at that point. Larry took over the supervision of that group at Lincoln Laboratory when he graduated. Um, 
the heads of the group left because they were not allowed to do cat research. In the process, he developed the first virtual reality system with a head-mounted display. He and Ivan Sutherland again put this thing together. In 1966, after Ivan had joined ARPA, DARPA then was called ARPA, as director of the Information Processing Techniques Office, he tried to get Larry to come as a program manager. And Larry said, no, I want to do research. I like research. And Ivan asked, and Larry said, no. So Ivan upped the ante. Ivan went to his boss, who went to the head of Lincoln Laboratory, who went to Larry's boss and said, Larry, it would behoove you to move to ARPA, because if you don't, they're going to take away 50% of Lincoln Laboratory's funding, which is ARPA supported. Larry decided, after thinking about it, to go to ARPA. While there, he was an expert at dealing with Congress on budget matters and managed to grow the budget from 15 million to 50 million by the time he left. In the process, he directed the development of the ARPANET, continued support of the ILIAC 4 development, set up speech understanding programs, and most of the AI program at ARPA, all of which the ARPA community is, is, is well known for. In 1973, he became the first president of what was then the first public package switching company in America. Telenet. In 1979, GTE bought Telenet, and they said you have to spend three more years here, so he did. He then went on to DHL to develop a subsidiary known as NetExpress, where he currently is head, um, to develop basically fax transmission over data networks in conjunction with the courier network. While he was with GTE, he developed the first fast packet switch, that was in 1980, at NetExpress. It's the first American company with a commercial, commercial ATM switch for the carrier market. Larry is a recipient of the Erickson Prize, probably one of the most prestigious prizes in our area, sometimes referred to as Nobel Prize in telecommunications. He's won presidential medals, the Harry M. Good Award, a whole pile of them. And he's one of the really smartest guys I know. I mean, he understands electronics, systems, software, how to manage systems, how to make them work, how to manage people, how to do funding. And more than that, he has the ability to take an abstract set of data and facts and merge them into a single chart which exposes so much that nobody's ever seen before. He's done it over and over again. You're going to see that kind of a thing today. Let me just add also for personal note, uh, Larry and I have been thrown out of the world's best gambling casinos. We viewed the total clips of the sun up in Maine some years ago. We finessed the silver coin market, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We can discuss that later. Right now, let's hear from Larry. He's going to talk about broadband uh, communications markets and services. Larry. Well, I've never had an introduction like that before. Somewhere a little later on in life, I did make nitroglycerin successfully, but uh, not at age six. Uh, OK, so what we're going to talk about today is the, uh, the whole evolution of the uh, broadband technology in the, uh, first the carrier market and then the local area market and how uh, ATM is going invade your life. Uh, and that's not teller machines. The, uh, this is basically a picture of what the, uh, uh, has happened in the, the network arena for the last uh, number of decades. Uh, as far as the peak speed available to the user, which is one of the things that the user sees. Back in 1969, I built the ARPANET, and that had a peak speed of 50 kilobits. That increased the speed over the 4.8 available on the public circuit switch network by uh, a factor of 10. And, and that same speed was used when I started telling it commercially in, in 73 on up through for the next 20 years. So for 20 years, people lived with about 64 kilobit type uh, data service, and that was, in fact, the, the growth of packet switching all through that period throughout the world. Uh, then the private network that ARPANET grew into, the internet, uh, started increasing the speed, and now is up to about 45 megabits. The internet went to one and a half and then 45 megabits. And of course, as you know, DARPA is doing experiments at the gigabit speed of 6.2 megabits in a number of uh, private uh, experiments throughout the country at this point. Meanwhile, the commercial uh, activity has proceeded to where we started with Frame Relay uh, in 1991, SMDS in 1992, and this year ATM will be introduced nationwide in 1993. Now, these are three different protocols for high-speed data service. Frame Relay is large, large blocks of data. SMDS is small ATM size, 53-byte cells. 
but with only uh, connectionless traffic, just in other words, no flow control except host to host. And ATM is dual queue, in other words, it supports real time plus the connectionless type uh, traffic. So it supports a wider range of, of traffic than SMD SLO. And uh, so these are three different uh, protocols and the standards in, in this area. And they're one year apart, actually, in terms of introduction in the US, which makes it, in fact, such a rapid introduction rate that most people are asking, should I start with this, this, or this, or what should I do? Because currently, they're still using X25 or SNA, probably. So the customers are, are we're all excited about frame relay. And then they got all excited about SMBS, and now almost everybody in the country is saying, well, I'll just go ahead with ATM, because that's the, that's the final standard, and that's probably the basis for the next 20 years. The reason why ATM is going to be so powerful in terms of this particular picture is ATM spans the entire speed range uh, of three orders of magnitude or more, from one megabit to uh, uh, several gigabits. So you can handle any speed range traffic, and it's, it's uh, spec for the entire speed range. Whereas the previous standards were very limited. Frame relay is just one and a half megabits, and, uh, and for example, X25, which is 64 to 1.5 megabits. Meanwhile, circuit switching has gone nowhere. Uh, ISDN is, is uh, not going to be probably used for practically anything. And uh, that leaves the, uh, uh, all of data to the fast packet switching uh, of these technologies. And uh, probably all of voice and video as well over the next decade. So almost all communications will be on the ATM networks in the next decade. Uh, now, are people going to move to these networks? The real question depends on price. Uh, the, the current, back in 1974, uh, I published this curve, which is the cost of communications is coming down at this rate, slowly. The cost of computing is coming down at this rate, as you know, about a factor of two every two years. So, the cost of communications plus the cost of, uh, of computing are the sum together make the cost of packet switching. Packet switching uses a certain amount of computation to augment the uh, communications to make it handle a mix of traffic. Circuit switching would be 15 times more expensive because uh, it would be uh, using that communications channel, the least line of cost here, inefficiently at about 15 to 1 for the old uh, time sharing type traffic. We found that that factor uh, wasn't totally achieved in the ARPANET, we got about 30% utilization of that optimal possibility. And all of the private ne networks since then have not been able to achieve that final curve because today this would take a T3 network, uh, a 45 megabit uh, backbone, a carrier loaded by, with you know, a very large loading of lots of traffic around the country. And in fact, this kind of efficiency and cost is being achieved today by the internet. The internet being the largest uh, network in existence today. 20, 28 T3s in the internet network. Uh, most private nets today, though, most corporations are running networks at about this price, which are about 13 cents a kilosegment. Kilosegment is 64,000 bytes. Whereas this price is about two to three cents a kilosegment. So the frame relay service that have been started have been priced at about three cents a kilosegment, and so is SMDS and ATM will be priced in the same range. So the prices that are coming out for commercial services of the high-speed data services are an order of magnitude less than people are now paying for their private networks. So with that price differential, plus the fact that the networks are far more reliable because they're a big commercial network, plus the fact that I have much more throughput because it's a big network with wide speed lines in the middle, means that I almost certainly will choose over the next five years to get rid of my private data network and go to a public data network for my long haul access. That's what's happened in voice over the past three or four years as, as the price of uh, commercial uh, uh, voice services has become cheaper than the price of private voice networks. So we already see the demise of private networks and the conversion to ATM. Another thing we'll see is that fax will convert. Fax today goes across the telephone network. It goes in on, a, on the PSDN, the public switch telephone network, and it goes across the telephone network on the telephone network and comes out outside of the group three fax. 9.6 kilobits with the modem. What's going to be happening is that you're going to start on your LAN, and you could have a server that put it out on the telephone network, went across the telephone network, and back into the LAN on the other side. That's not very attractive because that telephone network works at 9.6 kilobits with the modem, 
Whereas you could be going through the high-speed data network you're connected to, the ATM network, at 25 times the efficiency uh, because you're using better compression and don't have a motor. Uh, also, it's probably 100 times the speed and about 10 times less in cost. So the documents you could send as fax or image documents would be far more uh, economic and far larger and far faster. And so people want to also be able to send directly from terminal to terminal and not have to go through a common pool printer. So that I think that uh, very quickly, as people connect to the high-speed network, they're going to start moving their fax off the telephone network and moving it on to the data networks. Now, as they do that, they can also move back into group threes through protocol conversion equipment or from group threes into the network through other protocol conversion equipment. And therefore, uh, the large corporate users, I believe, will get off the telephone network altogether with fax. Now that's important because fax is the largest source of data today in the country. Uh, this is the revenue for all interstate, for the entire interstate market in the U.S. It's a triple that for the world. And the, uh, the, uh, the actual uh, total dollar volume in this is about $50 billion per year. Uh, voice is about 40, fax is about 7, and private data is about 4. And so together, the data market, which is the private data, land-to-land -land market, plus the, which is mainly private lines today, and the fax market, which is all on telephone network, is about $12 billion, or about 20% uh, of the total uh, market that's out there. Now, the, uh, that's increasing all the time. And those two, as I say, will convert over to this uh, uh, high-speed data market over the next five years. So as those two existing markets of small blocks of traffic, lots of accumulated small traffic, all the land-to-land -land traffic and all the facts in the commercial marketplace move across to this, uh, then we will see the growth of the high-speed data market from current established sources, not from new things like video conferencing and, and virtual reality and, and high-speed computer to computer access, but just basically from the things that everybody's doing today, sending documents to each other email and, and fact. And that's that market right there without any uh, elaboration. That quickly gets to be a multi-billion dollar market and in fact is sufficient to drive this industry. If that happens, uh, then this is the kind of switches that are needed for the network. You can take those same curves and roll them over and say, okay, what speed switch would be needed in Chicago if I built a network to support all that traffic? And that switch uh, for voice would be about a 20 gigabit per second speech. Uh, say 20 gigabit per second uh, switch. Now, uh, for fax, it would be about a gigabit per second, and in private data, about half a gigabit per second. So today, we have about one and a half gigabits per second of actual data traffic in the country that we could move over onto a network, accumulated traffic at peak hour. Uh, as we start building up the actual curve of what's happening, we have today, the frame relay is started, and then we're, on, we're right on that curve today. And that, will, that only requires 30 megabit switches. This is the speed of the switch that's required. Uh, that's fine. That's the first switches that came out, uh, Stratacom switch that are, are used by uh, the first su suppliers is about a 30, gigabit, a 30 megabit switch. So that's a fairly slow switch, and that's what's needed for frame relay. But that was going to be exceeded within a year. SMDS switches, which are called MAN switches, Metropolitan Area Network, typically were all SMDS switches, were provided by SM Siemens, Alcatel, and at and and those switches will peak out within the next year. And so right after that, we need to go to ATM switches So in order to handle this traffic level. Now, that's what most carriers in the world have decided, is that they're not going to bother putting any more switches in of the MAN or frame relay variety they're going to go directly to ATM switches to handle their entire traffic load for this coming uh, uh, activity. They may support SMBS and frame relay as protocols, but they're going to put in ATM switches to handle the traffic. Now that's, uh, I think almost every carrier in the world, and I've talked to most of them, has now made that decision uh, for the near future. The networks then look like this in terms of what the long haul carrier networks will look like. The IXCs are basically MCI, Sprint, ATMT in the US, and similar people overseas. They would connect directly to the customers, and they would also connect to the Airbot networks for local access. And each network would be built up with a mesh of ATM switches. Each switch would support 
print relay, SMDS, and ATM. That's protocols, all three protocols. So you could have whatever you wanted. And the switch that we're building uh, for this market, the switch that NEC and Fujitsu are building, the three commercial switches in the market today, uh, all support all three protocols and are competing in this segment of the market today. Uh, so there are switches that are currently being sold this year for doing this, and this is in fact what most carriers in the US and overseas are looking at today to install during 1993 for their network for uh, supplying this demand over the next decade. The switch that we're actually building uh, is um, a four gigabit uh, platform. Uh, it's basically got ATM and SMDS trunking. In other words, you can interconnect the switches with either ATM or SMDS, uh, two standard protocols for interconnection. You have frame relay, SMDS, and ATM for access lines. OC3 is 155 megabits per second, and OC12 is 6.2 megabits per second. Those are the sonic rates. Uh, T3 is 45 megabits and T1 is one and a half. So those are the rates that are typically used today for the various access lines that the carriers supply to customers. Uh, OC3 will start being supplied to customers shortly and OC12 probably not for a while. But OC12 will be a trunk rate you'll see in the network quite soon. The switch itself is got a four gigabit uh, fully redundant bus, uh, four gigabit per second. It's a bus structure rather than a banyan uh, or batch of banyan or, or a cross bar switch. And that's important because by doing that, we have uh, very much lower cost than the other uh, systems in the market and much more modularity. Secondly, we have uh, a very high speed packet processing capability of a million calls per second either ATM calls or SMDS packets. That's fairly unique, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. So that's sort of what's unique about the switch we're building. However, the switches in the market uh, actually uh, range in speed from uh, two gigabits to eight gigabits, with this is sort of in the middle. Those are the three commercial switches we see today, and uh, at and is actually saying they're going to build one at 20 next year so that we have that new uh, data point appearing. Digital circuit switches, which have been the fastest switches today in terms of the switches on the market, are 7 gigabits generally, the tandem switches in the center of the phone network. And the other switches out there, of course, the MAN switches, which I mentioned, which I don't think will be built much longer, and the frame relay switches, which I don't think will be. And of course, the X25 switch is all the way from our first 100 kilobit ARPANET M up to the four megabit uh, X25 switches that exist today uh, in the X25 network. But almost all the corporate and carrier switches will be going into the gigabit speed range with ATM in the near future. But a much more important way to look at this is on two dimensions. That's just the dimension of actual bandwidth of the switch. But a much more uh, important point of view from my, point of, my perspective is not only how fast is the switch in bits per second, how much data can it move, but how fast is it in calls per second? How many calls can it handle per second? How many different packets can it handle? What different addresses can it handle? Uh, give you a new address, you gotta do something with it. You gotta set up a route. When that happens, uh, and you do this on a log log scale, you find that if the average size of the transaction, the average transaction is a thousand bytes, then a one gigabit switch can handle 100,000 calls per second. If it couldn't handle that many, if it only could handle 1,000, then of course you have something that can really only handle 10 megabits if the average call is 1,000 bytes. So it's very important to look at the average call size and see what we have. Well, for voice, we have a two megabyte average call. That's voice. And the circuit switches were well positioned to handle that. Uh, they were seven gigabit switches with about 1,000 calls per second, maximum 500 calls per second that they could handle. X25 is well positioned for its traffic. The traffic here is about two to 500 bytes per second average for the connectionless traffic in the internet today and for the LAN traffic is about two to 500 bytes per call average. And the current X25 switches handle that well, so the routers. Routers are the primary thing that you see in uh, local area networks today to handle the traffic. And they're switching that at about 30,000 calls per second and about 100 megabits. That's the fastest people have been able to do software switching of both calls and data. Now, that's sort of the max of a processor in doing software switching. 
Anything above that in either dimension, you really need to use hardware to do switching with. In other words, you need to use hardware to switch the data or hardware to switch the call because you go faster. Well, the MAN switches basically use hardware to switch the call, I mean the data, and the MAN switches are basically uh, uh, 200 megabit devices. Siemens and Alcatel and at and switches are there. The big circles are actual implementations. The ATM switches almost all cluster in this range here for a reason which is almost beyond me. Um, the standard for switching protocol has not quite been finished in ATM. In other words, people are still working on the standard. But it's been uh, well agreed that the standard will be based on Q931, which is the standard for switching voice calls in the voice network. Uh, that's a old Belcore standard that uh, all of the voice people love. Uh, the uh, standard takes a lot of time to negotiate across the network, and you know, 100 milliseconds or so after you've started making the, the call set up, you'll get the call set up, and then you can start sending data. And the result is it's so complicated that you can only handle 1,000 calls per second, no matter how you process it, because it's basically processor intensive. So that all of the switches that were implemented have wound up at 1,000 calls per second, for the reason that that's the fastest you can do in a central processor. Well, so that the AT&T switch and the uh, NEC, the Fujitsu switch and the, and the NEC switch that have all been built, and plus the commercial uh, corporate switches, the four uh, switch, the uh, adaptive switch, and the uh, NPR and um, Washington University switch are all operating at essentially that speed range for calls per second. They expected uh, essentially to work with this protocol for doing that. They expected the standards were the right method to capitalize on. The problem is that nobody thought about the problem that voice is not the thing we're sending. And so since these switches are primarily geared for data to begin with, the calls will not be one megabyte or two megabyte calls, but they're going to be 500 or 1,000 byte calls. And if that's true, then these switches, even though they're gigabit switches, will only be able to handle 10 megabits in traffic if they can only handle 1,000 calls per second. And so there's a serious place, uh, problem there. We actually designed the switch to handle nine calls per second and use hardware assist and caching memory to do this because we felt that it was critical that we'd be able to handle many, many more calls per second. Many more than the man switches did for SMBS and many more than the ATM switches did for uh, this. In doing so, we can, cannot use Q931 as a protocol. We invented a new protocol called Fast, called Fast Select, which I'll tell you about. Uh, that is much simpler and much more straightforward for the user. And, or we use SMDS as a protocol, either one, and we can achieve that rate. But we believe that this was a serious mistake, actually, in terms of the uh, standards at the moment. And we're trying to get that changed, although the voice people have pretty much control of the standards activity in this area. Uh, I'll come back to that issue a little bit more, but that's sort of one of the things that's going on in ATM. I've looked into the future uh, traffic and, and to find out what the average bandwidth really, the average call length really is. And to do that, I've looked at what is all the traffic that's out there. This is all the traffic in the country today. We have 100 gigabits of originating voice traffic in the US. We have about a gigabit of originating fax traffic, fax traffic and about a half a gigabit of email traffic, and practically nothing of broadcast TV. Very little starts out, and it goes to lots of people, but it doesn't. Not much starts out. We will have a lot of video conferencing occurring as we get into ATM directly to the terminal because ATM to the terminal will give you the capability to do video conferencing almost free for $200 addition to your workstation. Uh, and so I expect that will build up and over the next two decades uh, grow to be the largest single activity unless fax again exceeds it or image traffic later on. Uh, meanwhile, voice doesn't change hardly anything. And uh, we may have video on demand, which will come as another factor here. And I can't place that because it's not clear what's going to happen with video on demand. But it may be the biggest thing after a short while. But clearly, for the next decade, before the year 2000, the biggest single thing is going to be the current uh, email and fax traffic that we have. And those will dominate the kind of traffic levels we have. Now, if I take the call length of each call, I have this huge range of call length, of course. Uh, email is very small call, fax is bigger yet, 100,000 bytes, voice is bigger yet, video conferencing and broadcast TV. The average is down around 20,000 bytes even today of all of that traffic. 
to take a further step of deciding how much of that traffic will be on the high-speed data networks. And I, and I note that the voice is going to have a slow deployment as well as the broadcast TV, and the others will go on very quickly in time. That is, what percent of that traffic will be on by what year. And if I make uh, reasonable projections of what that is, I can compute then what the average call length is, given all that information. The average call length today, I see is like 500 bytes. It will grow to 10,000 bytes by the end of the dec decade. But that's sort of the range that we have to deal with, 1,000 to 10,000 bytes. And that's, the, that's what we're going to see as far as those calls go over the next decade or so. As a result, we need to do something about the signaling protocol so that it can work at the higher speed rates that I talked about and handle these shorter calls. The protocol which we've been trying to standardize is called Fast Select. And we have built this into our switch and believe that it will, in fact, solve this problem. It has a single cell to set up the call rather than a whole collection of link cells with fixed, fixed addresses for everything, fixed locations. The destination address, the VC, the priority, and the information rate. Now, we, the originator specifies the virtual circuit in this case. Now, in a uh, Q931 call, the uh, standard voice call, the destination specifies the virtual circuit. So that I have to ask for a virtual circuit, he comes back to me with a response, and then I can cycle the next section of the network and the next and the next. So I have a, a challenge response for every section of the network. That takes forever to do, plus it means that the, the network cannot just look at the information and pass it on. It has to respond, and that takes a lot more logic. And as a result, uh, we can't do this with a single uh, hardware process. We have to go into software processing. Uh, we take, and take this single cell and self turn it through the network. In other words, it just works its way through the network to the destination. We've got to be able to predict the entire route that it's going to take ahead of time and move it on its route without it having to back up. And the uh, information rate, if it requested one, can be then returned to the originator with an information rate that's guaranteed or uh, it may have none. And there's a single cell to terminate the call. So basically it looks like this. There's a single cell that starts out. It says that it wants to use uh, on a signaling, on a signaling virtual circuit. It says it wants to use virtual circuit N, and here's the address it wants to go to. And all of the packets following it say N, and they can follow immediately. And the terminating says, OK, I'm done with N. And that's all you have to do. And all the workstation manufacturers in the country have looked at this and said, this is what we got to do. We shouldn't have anything very complex. I want something very simple. But the voice manufacturers have said, no, we want something very complex. So we have that fight going on. Um, the actual format for that, I won't bore you with the details, but it has uh, the destination address, the bandwidth you want, and the carrier and the VC in the one cell. Now, if you're sending that to a, for a real-time application, then uh, for a voice video uh, call, then you would send the first setup packet, get a confirmation back, and then send your data. Uh, you'd wait for the confirmation, and then send your data, because now you'd have your information bandwidth guaranteed. And you could send your video call or whatever for as long as you wanted. Currently, that's a six-minute call. Uh, if you were sending a file to somebody else, you would just send your first setup packet, uh, the data and send the terminating packet all in real time. And it would travel across the country or the world as a little train going across the country. And uh, that might take a millisecond, uh, a tenth of a millisecond to send your 500 byte thing at 45 megabits. And whereas the round trip across the US is like 20 milliseconds, uh, sending this is about 200 times faster. So that you wouldn't have to waste 200 milli 20 milliseconds to send that tenth of a millisecond worth of data. Looking at more graphically, if you look at sending a document across the world, uh, I start out in San Francisco, I send it to Tokyo, and the, set, the header is here, and the trailer is here, and the data is in the middle, and it just sort of works its way across every switch in the network. Now, what that means is every switch in the network has to have buffering for that piece of data. In fact, it has to have enough buffering, so if I kept on sending data, it would have time to tell the host what it was sending to slow down which means that every stage of the network has to have at least about 100 milliseconds worth of buffering uh, at any speed it's operating. In OC12, that's about 8 megabytes. 8 megabytes isn't that expensive. 
I mean, eight, eight megabytes you have in your PC uh, relatively cheaply. So it's not that expensive to, to put in that much buffering so that all across the world that these things can happen and uh, you're going to have a delay of probably up to 100 milliseconds then, in the worst case, because I might hit that much traffic in one of these buffers. But the, the traffic will go through at the maximum possible rate, and there won't be any issue of trying to guarantee a channel or ask for a certain bandwidth or do anything else. You just send at the maximum possible rate, and if it tells you to slow down, slow down. And as long as we've got the, the, the uh, mechanism for slowing you down worked out properly, everything works fine. Now, that's one of the research areas that we need help in. Uh, nobody is in the in the standards area has quite settled on exactly what feedback mechanisms are the best for this, but what have been proposed are uh, if I hit congestion, let's say at, at the middle of the net or even at the end of the net, to send a forward notification to the host at the end saying there's congestion on this tra on this channel, and that host would tell the other host through a backward channel of its own uh, to slow down, and then the host it was sending would slow down. Uh, that's one way to do it. The other way to do it is to send a backward notification from this point in the network immediately. That's somewhat better, but it's not easy to do in the network. And so uh, it's not easy to find the other side uh, of the switch. So that's something which uh, the network people have been avoiding. And so at the moment, the standards are moving along the line of forward only uh, notification or no notification. And if you have no notification, then you have to wait for lost cells and TCP IP, in fact, implemented that way today. TCP IP says if you are sending and I don't get a response, then I must have lost the something, so I'll slow down. But of course, then I have to lose something before I slow down. And that's not a very good algorithm, and it doesn't work as well as we'd like. But it will work, and that's the way things operate on SMDS today. Uh, I believe that this mechanism will be better if we can work out the right notification. And the question there is to, to uh, try and, and, and a number of different techniques and make them work. In the other case of the, uh, the real-time, let me just mention the, the control mechanisms that are needed. In the case where I'm sitting on the path and receiving confirmation of that bandwidth guarantee, uh, what I'm doing is I'm saying I want, say, uh, a megabit worth of uh, peak rate and a uh, quarter megabit per second were at the average rate, or and some burstiness criteria, perhaps. So I have sent two or three pieces of information when I set up the call to the network. The network then, at each node of the network, as it transits the network, uh, takes that information and says, I'll put that over across the channel that I can have that much capacity and guarantee it to you, so that I can guarantee you very low delay if you give me that uh, uh, traffic that's shaped according to those rules. And in addition, it'll probably police you. So when you do, in fact, send data, it will make sure you don't send anything faster than those three uh, contracts. In other words, your average is not over uh, the quarter megabit per second, and your peak does not exceed a megabit per second. And if it does, it'll mark your cells for discard eligibility. And if any place in the network doesn't want, to want them, it throws them away then. So that uh, it doesn't throw them away immediately, but it will throw them away at some point if, you, uh, if you've exceeded your thresholds. And then the confirmation will come back to you saying, OK, I've set up this channel at that bandwidth, or some lower bandwidth if that's all I can achieve. Uh, now, that's the, the current concept. Now, in the standards bodies today, they're about ready to vote on this. They have two parameters, peak and average rate, that they're thinking of. They don't know how to set up the calls at each buffer. They don't know what the queuing algorithm is for me to use within the, the switch to allocate to the channel. I hope that Kleinrock will work that out someday. Uh, or somebody at some university. The problem is that still has to be worked on. And they don't know whether three parameters should be used of burstiness or not, and whether that's necessary. And what we know about traffic today is that it's, uh, that you probably have to go to at least the uh, uh, second moment or third moment of the traffic in order to get enough characteristics of it to know what its shape is in burstiness. So we need a lot of research on that very quickly or accumulate all the research that's been done in the next few months so that we can drive the standards process, or else we'll make the wrong decision, and it'll take a very long time to change. Uh, so that's one of the things that's going on. And then when that's agreed, we need, still need algorithms for building the switches as to how to allocate the channels given this information. And then we still need the policing algorithms to police it on the input and output. So those are a lot of the things that are needed in that area. But if you do all of that, and you do it reasonably well, 
then my prediction is that this channel will have a delay variance of under three milliseconds for data end to end through that channel. In other words, delay, the jitter on any cell coming out will be less than three milliseconds. That's good for voice, that's good for video, and that basically doesn't uh, have sufficient jitter that there'll be any echo problems on, on, on voice, for example. Now if we move to the local area network scene for a minute, the, uh, the uh, local area networks have uh, also gotten very involved with ATM. ATM is, we started out as a long haul transit uh, concept and has now moved into and perhaps even uh, exceeding the uh, interest level in the local market as it is in the long haul. The switch that we are making for the carrier market, which we're selling through DSC to the carrier market, we're selling directly in the, in the corporate market, and so we're also involved in this market. And there are about four, six, four or five switch vendors in this market building ATM switches. These basically are switches that will also be in the gigabit speed range, one to five gigabits generally today. Uh, they will connect to the long haul network. They will permit uh, transparent traffic like uh, constant bitrate traffic, uh, video voice that are going to your PBX or your video stations, to be passed across that along with everything else. Because one of the things ATM does is it has a mode which permits constant bitrate traffic. As I say, it's going to have maybe a three millisecond jitter by the time it comes out of this pipe, but even so, we can put that in a slip buffer and come out with no jitter. So we have a three millisecond slip buffer and we come out with constant bitrate traffic. So we pass that to your PBX cross from the carrier network. And so you can use one channel from the carrier to you and have on that one channel all of your uh, voice, video, data, everything together. Secondly, it's going to connect to the ATM uh, hubs and the routers in your uh, network. So, in, so there's going to be a campus network of ATM lands, which is one in each building probably. Plus, those will, connect, those will connect to all the routers and hubs in the buildings to connect to all of the devices. And those will feed all the traffic from the various local areas, Ethernet and token ring and FDDI, into the ATM network. That's the immediate concept. Because ATM has bandwidths that are uh, in the gigabit speed range as opposed to the 100 megabit range of the routers and can handle the consolidated traffic a lot better than, than the uh, uh, current uh, routers, which today, to do this, people put in 50, 50 to 100 routers to do the same job. And if you look in the basement of Bear Stearns in New York, for example, you find 50 routers all lined up in a row trying to do this job, and they're handling 10 gigabits of traffic. Uh, now, 10 gigabits seems like a lot of traffic, but there are companies that are handling that much traffic in one building today. Um, and that's because they're handling every stock transaction, every workstation, plus video clips flying back and forth between every uh, person all the time on the host uh, server. So in server client activities like the stock brokerage industry or in Boeing when you're doing aircraft design and so on, you wind up with very high bit rates and you need networks with gigabit speeds inside the central loops and 100 megabit type speeds to the servers. That's the market that people are now seeing for underwriting their corporate network. They can then go through the long haul carrier networks to have their long haul access. Now there's another part of that that's going to occur and is being talked about a lot, and that is direct ATM to the workstation. Today, people are going to the workstation with Ethernet, Token Ring, or FTDI. Now the problems with those are they're, they have lots of delay and lots of delay jitter. Uh, FTDI is pretty fast, pretty expensive, but pretty fast. But uh, most of these things are as fast as you probably need at the workstation. They're 10 megabits. Well, 10 megabits is pretty fast. The average throughput is much lower, but they're sufficient if they go direct. And the, the hub technology is, has an Ethernet to every terminal, uh, a separate one. But even so, there's still a lot of delay jitter in that technology, and ATM has no delay jitter to speak of, like that, again, might be three milliseconds, and so you can put voice across it where you can't in the other. And you can have 100 megabits on a twisted pair, which will get you to handle video and, and imaging much more effectively. So people are looking at this as the next technology for getting to the workstation. And then also it turns out that it will probably be cheaper than any of the other technologies because it's simpler. Now, the kind of switches that are, be building, that are being built are much like this, which is what we're building. Uh, and this has got ATM boards connected to a very high speed bus, uh, which can handle OC12 or 622 megabits per second. Uh, OC3 or this 
twisted pair, uh, 16 ports actually, a ton, um, OC, uh, essentially OC3, but not OC3 standard. This is the, the compromise people made for twisted pair because twisted pair currently only works at 100 megabits. And then T3 and T1. And it supports all those protocols, typically for all of those same uh, applications I just showed. Uh, this particular switch works at 4 gigabits where we uh, uh, have inside it uh, a lot of programmable gate arrays at the moment. Most of those are being converted to ASICs as we can get the standards finished. The nice thing about programmable gate arrays is that uh, as the standards fluctuate and the, er the protocols aren't quite finished, we can keep on changing them daily uh, even when it's in the field. And then uh, when we get it fixed, we can reduce the cost by going to an ASIC. Now, in order to get this down in price, we need to go to a lot of ASICs, and so we'd like to get all the standards stabilized very quickly. But for the time being, and most of the switches going out, there will be programmable gate arrays in the area of ingress processing of packets coming in. Packets come in on the output ch channels, go through a formatter, which gets rid of the local protocol. In other words, a single uh, ASIC or, or gate array gets converts frame relay or SMDS or ATM uh, into cells and chops it up into cells and puts it into buffers for the two queues of the two time delays and brings it over to the other board which is essentially doing cell processing and that basically does ingress processing which is to decide what route is to take and uh, to set up the bandwidth guarantees and do the kind of things that you need to set up the bandwidth in the, the, the call. It then puts it onto the bus, which goes to all the other uh, uh, boards. And on the other boards in the switch, it will receive that call at 4 gigabits per board into what we call cell buffer ASICs, which are processing it off again into two queues, putting it into VRAM or very, very fast uh, video RAM for the buffering needed to support uh, this 100 milliseconds delay or the, the smaller delays of the other queue. And then any adaptation that's needed on the exit, which may include uh, egress process of uh, various kinds, and then out. And so basically, that's the kind of switch that's being built, uh, and the kinds of algorithms that have to be in there. The worst case part of that is probably the policing, when we have to police everybody to make sure that every cell they send is not exceeding the bandwidths that they've agreed to. And that's hardware on every cell that goes through the switch. Well, that's enough of the internal issues about the switch. Why is ATM going to be used in the campus networks? Well, it's higher packet throughput of about a million calls per second uh, rather than 30,000 calls or packets per second. That's the router versus the ATM switch. That's at least my view of what an ATM switch should be. Some of them don't handle that many. That's essential if you're somebody like Bear Stearns and have a tremendous traffic load, uh, or Boeing or somebody like that. Secondly, there's much higher peak bandwidth available. In other words, if I, my cumulative traffic demands are that high, that I need 4 gigabits versus 100 megabits. It's probably not quite as common as the higher throughput requirement, but it's also important. The next thing is that I do want a fully compatible uh, network nationwide, worldwide. In other words, I don't want to have a separate technology in the LAN and the MAN and the WAN and all across the world. I would like to have one homogeneous network that I can just plug and play pieces throughout the world, and they all are homogeneous, and I'm not changing protocols from place to place, and not trying to translate from one to another, because it doesn't fit together that well. ATM basically will be the basis of public nets, that's clear. And uh, whether it becomes the basis of private nets in the local environment is uh, perhaps still a question, but it's becoming very clear that that's the direction everybody's going. And the, it's also a uniform address space. It uses an extended E-164 addressing such that the whole world will have, every port, every terminal in the world will have an address. You'll know what that address is. You won't have to translate IP addresses. Uh, the network will know what to do with it. It'll just send it. If you want to publish your address, you can publish your address. Now, there are some moves that actually have IP address translation at the periphery of the network, so you can use those as well. And that's being adopted by the forum, I think. But in general, the you know, form address space means the network which works much more smoothly than having to do uh, as many lookups at all the various locations. And the most important thing in the long term is probably the low delay. Now that's going to be the driver. As people move to using their workstations for voice and video, which I believe is going to happen, 
than the three millisecond milligrams versus 30 for, for FTDI and much more for all the others will become an important parameter and one that will drive people to go to ATM. At the workstation level, there's an additional question. Well, then I can have it my campus net, but I can still use Ethernet for my workstation. And most of the same criteria are true. Here I need high bandwidth. There are lots of people out there who are saying, well, when a doctor's looking at an x-ray, he wants to get that up in a few seconds, and these are gigabit images, and I have to move them at 100 megabit speeds in order to get them up at reasonable speeds. And he's not willing to have compression on a, on a medical image uh, because somebody might do aliasing. Whereas most of you, when you're looking at a picture of uh, uh, your favorite sports star, don't care about image compression, and you can handle it at 10 megabits. Uh, 100 megabits is necessary for a lot of the, the high image, uh, high imaging that is going on in the country today. There's also the uh, the compatibility of the stress states, but again, the delay is probably the biggest driver for this area. Uh, the delay and the peak bandwidth, plus probably the fact the cost will be lower. Now, if I want to have voice and video on my uh, workstation or in my all the way to the workstation, I've got to have at every stage of the network something that has reasonably low delay. Uh, 100 milliseconds would make it sound like it was on a satellite or 100, more than 100, and, and I don't want that. Uh, my delay variance, though, should be probably down in the 3 millisecond range. Most of you probably don't know why that should be. Uh, that's because if you exceed uh, 12 milliseconds total delay in any voice, then you exceed the uh, bell specs for delay uh, without echo cancellation. And if you try, do exceed that, I can guarantee you that if you talk across a network with 12 milliseconds delay or more to an analog phone at the other end, you will have a, a fairly unrecognizable telephone call because you, you, the bounce of echo off that analog phone will mess up your signal considerably. And that, that's something which digital people are not terribly aware of, but the telephone people have been quite aware of for a long time, that uh, you need echo cancellers if you exceed that kind of delay. The delay to variance is over three milliseconds. You are going to, in fact, uh, incur slip buffering that requires you to exceed 12 milliseconds. You also probably have to have at least one and a half megabits for video if you're going to do video conferencing. Uh, and on the way in, that basically, uh, the delay variance exceeds all of the current protocols except ATM. And on the lands, the same is true. Uh, FDDI, Token Ring, and Ethernet all have much larger delays than are, uh, than are possible for voice. FDDI, in fact, might work, but would have 30 millisecond delay, and that would, in fact, require uh, echo cancellation. Now, just in terms of what the delays really are, uh, I've plotted here the delay for uh, various different protocols. Uh, T1 and uh, T3 channel. This is a T1 channel, a 1.5 megabit channel with frame relay. Frame relay uh, has basically, this is just the standard deviation of the delay, not the total delay, because the standard deviation is probably the important part. The standard deviation is virtually 100 milliseconds, whereas in SMBS, that's because of the large size of the packets. SMBS basically uh, more like a tenth of a millisecond, and the same with ATM. Uh, the same is here in terms of SMBS and ATM. Again, this is not ATM where I have this uh, guaranteed channel, but this is the ATM slow channel, the low priority ATM channel. It's the same as SMBS, basically. And then when I go to OC3, I have an even uh, lower delay, but not that much lower. So that's what the delay variance is if I don't have the guaranteed bandwidth in the channel. And then with guaranteed bandwidth, I can reduce that to uh, even less. Now, one of the things that's going to happen to create uh, voice uh, video for the workstation, and I think it's going to be one of the revolutions of the next decade, is that today we do computing with our workstation, we do messaging with our workstation. We do email, we do all sorts of messaging, and we're going to do more video messaging, but, uh, and we do computing. But we don't do any real-time communication. We don't talk to another person, uh, hardly ever. Occasionally we do tell that to a computer. But, uh, at, the current price of ATM, or frame relay, or any of these, uh, the land-to-land -land communication, if I had standard voice chips, silence detected 32 kilobit CBSD voice, 
If I put that in my terminal, which is a very cheap enterprise to put as, a, uh, as an extra board in the back of my terminal with a jack for my telephone, I could have voice at 3.8 cents a minute. Well, you know, today, if you buy voice from uh, your standard carrier, you're going to pay 15 cents a minute. So 3.8 cents is a bargain. Uh, the, uh, secondly, the quality here is perfect. You have no uh, digital voice with no, uh, no problems with it. Thirdly, you can use your workstation as a phone book dialer with programming it just like you want it to do anything you want, and a screener so that any calls coming in can be uh, screened so that if uh, the right person calls me, the call comes through, otherwise it goes to a recording. And uh, I can also use video for if it's T1 full time at $5 a minute, but if it's variable rate compression, I get that down to a dollar a minute. And if I'm willing to go with somewhat lower quality than T1 quality, I could get that well below a dollar a minute. So video conferencing becomes quite economic, below a dollar a minute type uh, price range, and uh, becomes quite reasonable. And secondly, I can view all the participants of the video conference on, on a video conference on my screen at once. And I can see who wants to talk and do the priority settings and everything else. Uh, the, I could also move the images and documents to the other person while I'm talking. So now my, my workstation in one window becomes an enhanced telephone, and all the software that anybody wants to sell me to enhance that, I can buy, and I don't have to wait for my PBX vendor to come out with a new release, which takes forever. So my belief is that uh, people will quickly move to that as the ATM becomes available to the workstation, and there's lots of vendors out there today preparing software for that environment. So that will add a whole new specter to what is available on the workstation, and I think video conferencing, even an invoice, will take over quickly uh, at the workstation. Now, in terms of the overall market uh, for the corporate market, today we have about a $2 billion market. It's D1Muxes and router bridges are the two pieces that are the primary part of what ATM lands will start uh, into. <coughs> X25 switches is much lower than another piece. The ATM switches will start uh, substituting for both the router bridges and the T1 boxes because they replace both basically on that network. And so over the next decade, you'll find that uh, they basically uh, replace those components of it and the, the two or three billion dollar market will grow uh, and it will take over that segment of the market. So that's really what I'm predicting will happen in that segment of the market in the local area network. And the reason that many people believe that ATM is really going to happen there is one of homogeneity, that it is, a, it is the standard of the future, it is homogeneous across the whole network, and it really simplifies the uh, moves and changes and uh, additions to the network and the whole um, structure of the whole network. That basically gives you a quick overview of ATM, and I'll look for questions.